Welcome. My name is Brian Lacey. I'm professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm delighted to be a part of the IFFGD 30th anniversary lecture series. And over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to discuss pharmacologic and surgical treatment for the small and large intestine. Recognizing that there have been a variety of other really great lectures, I will not really be focusing on the diagnosis of these disorders, nor will I cover dietary interventions. So my objectives today, to review the most common functional motility disorders of the small and large intestine, I'm going to discuss current pharmacologic treatment options and discuss the limited surgical options available. The topics we'll cover today specifically will be irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, some patients refer to this as SIBO, other disorders of the small intestine, chronic bloating and distension, chronic idiopathic constipation, and colonic inertia. Let's begin with IBS or irritable bowel syndrome because that's really the best studied and probably the best understood disorder of gut-brain interaction, also called functional bowel disorders. And when I think about the treatment for IBS, treatment really depends upon disease severity. So as a patient, um, some patients have kind of mild symptoms, meaning that the symptoms are present, whether it's pain or diarrhea or constipation or alternating constipation, diarrhea, and of course, bloating is so common as well. But if those symptoms are not burdensome, are not affecting your home life, social life, professional life, that for many patients, simple interventions, including a great explanation about what IBS is, reassurance that this never turns into anything bad or dangerous, using over-the-counter medications and maybe some lifestyle interventions such as changes in diet, better sleep and physical exercise, well, all that's required. However, patients with moderate or more severe symptoms generally require pharmacologic treatment, meaning prescription medications, and may also require other treatments involving coexisting anxiety or depression, which frequently goes hand in hand with any disorder that's chronic in nature. When I think about medical treatments for IBS with constipation, when the constipation symptom is predominant, there are a number of options available. I won't cover probiotics or complementary and alternative medication, abbreviated as CAM or osmotic agents because they've been covered elsewhere. I'm gonna focus on the five medications approved by the Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of IBS with constipation. The first group are those that we call secretagogues, and they're called secretagogues because generally these three medications, when they work in the GI tract, cause the GI tract to secrete fluid into the GI tract, which increases transit through the GI tract. The first agent is lubaprostone, also sold as amatiza. This accelerates small bile and colon transit it's approved for the treatment of both men and women with chronic idiopathic constipation and women with IBS and constipation. Speak to your doctor about this medication. It's safe and it's effective. It comes in two different doses, eight micrograms and 24 micrograms. Linaclotide is a medicine called a GCC agnus. It acts on the guanolate cyclase C receptor. It too improves movement through the GI tract. It also has been shown to act on the sensory nerves in the GI tract to improve abdominal pain. It's approved again for both IBSC and for chronic idiopathic constipation. And it comes in three different doses, 72, 145, and 290 micrograms. The new kit on the block is placanotide, sold as True Lance. It comes in one form only, three milligrams, and it too is approved for both chronic idiopathic constipation and IBS with constipation. The other two agents both begin with T. One is tenapinor, the other is tegacerod. Tenapinor acts quite differently. It acts on a different receptor involving the sodium hydrogen exchanger. There's very good data from a large randomized controlled trial showing benefits compared to placebo. It was approved by the FDA in September 2019. 
Distribution has still been a little bit tricky, so it's a little hard to get, but it is available and it's very effective for IBS-C symptoms. And then Tegasrod acts on the serotonin receptor system. In this case, it acts on the 5-HT4 or the type 4 serotonin receptor, and it stimulates that receptor to improve motility in the GI tract and improve visceral or gut pain. There's a bit of a storied history where it came out and then was withdrawn voluntarily due to some safety concerns, but it was reapproved for the treatment of IBSC in women less than 65 years of age without a cardiovascular history. And this is very safe in that population. It's sold in a six milligram form. Let's shift gears now and talk about medical treatments for IBS with diarrhea. And I'd like to show this slide because it shows there are so many different treatment options, once again, in the interest of time, because the topics are covered elsewhere. I won't talk about diet or probiotics or some of the simpler agents. I just wanna mention that the 5-HT3 antagonist, Alocitron, that acts on the type three serotonin receptor. Very good data from large randomized studies showing it improves urgent diarrhea, it improves urgency, it improves pain and bloating in patients with IBS and diarrhea. It's approved by the Food and Drug Administration for women with symptoms that persist despite using either dietary interventions or Imodium, loperamide. The gut selective antibiotic, Rifaximin, has been shown in three very large randomized placebo-controlled trials to improve IBS with diarrhea symptoms, including gas, bloating, urgency, diarrhea. Finally, Elux Adeline is sold, uh, and this improves IBS diarrhea symptoms. It acts on the opioid receptors in the GI tract to slow the GI tract a little bit, but not causing horrible constipation, and improve symptoms of urgency and diarrhea as well. In terms of eluxatiline, if you've had your gallbladder removed or you have had a history of pancreatitis, you should not take that medication, but I am sure your healthcare provider will know that. Let's talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, a common question that comes up from patients when they have symptoms of gas and bloating. And the treatment for that involves first thinking about the underlying disorder. We look at the medication list because some medications slow small bowel transit. By eliminating those medications, we can increase transit, get rid of the underlying problem, and thus improve symptoms of bacterial overgrowth. And then sometimes, in some patients, we accelerate small bowel transit to improve symptoms. Or we can target the bacterial overgrowth directly and use the antibiotics. I'm going to come back to that in a second. In the occasional patient, long-standing bacterial overgrowth leads to nutritional issues, and your healthcare provider will want to investigate that and treat appropriately by replacing fat-soluble vitamins and also B12 and calcium and magnesium. Which antibiotic might you want to use for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? This slide shows treatment options available. I wish I could tell you that one was significantly better than the other, but there have been no head-to-head -head comparisons. And thus, it's really important that you have a nice discussion with your healthcare provider about the risks, the benefits, and the cost of each of these agents. What about small intestinal dysmotility and chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction? If you've listened to some of these other lectures, you're now comfortable with those topics. The most common cause of small bowel dysmotility or slow transit is the connective tissue disorder, scleroderma. Other connective tissue disorders can cause symptoms, including SLE or lupus or dermatomyositis or polymyositis, but those myopathic disorders are much less common. Treatment options, we could think about a prokinetic agent, and a prokinetic agent is a medication designed to increase transit through the GI tract. Generally, we think about the 5-HT4 agonist coming back again to the medications that act on the serotonin system. 5-HT4 stands for serotonin, and this acts on a type 4 receptor, so we use Prucalipride. Uh, this is sold as a prescription as Motegrity, or as I mentioned, we can use Tegasarod. That's sold as Zelnorm. Um, both of these agents are safe and effective. 
Some patients require injections, and that's octreotide, and that's the one medicine that's been tested to really show that it helps small bowel transit. Um, can be very effective, although many patients don't like to take shots. As I already mentioned before, sometimes we use these agents called secretagogues, such as linaclotide or placanotide, sold as Linzess or Trulance to accelerate small bowel transit. And occasionally we use medications that block acetylcholine esterase. That's the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. And we may use pyridostigmine or rarely neostigmine because by blocking that enzyme, it accelerates small bowel and colon transit. What about the problem with bloating and distension? This is so common and is found in patients with IBS and chronic constipation and bacterial overgrowth and even functional dyspepsia and gastroparesis. When I see a patient and I start thinking about the pathophysiology of bloating and distension, I like to think about three major processes, things that stretch the bowel wall causing tension and discomfort. I think about being too sensitive in the GI tract, this augmented conscious perception of wall tension. And I think about an abnormal viscerosomatic reflex. That's an abnormal gut muscle wall reflex. Let me go through those briefly. When I think about patients who have increased bowel wall tension, what treatment options do we have available? The first is dietary modifications. I'm sure you've heard this before from other lectures. I won't go through that, but it's nice to see this on the slide for your own knowledge. We can modulate the microbiome. So as we've discussed for SIBO in the past, we may use antibiotics. Some providers use probiotics. I generally don't do that because the data is not very strong. And many times probiotics makes bloating worse or as we've already mentioned, we can accelerate gastrointestinal transit using a prokinetic agent or a secretagogue. If I believe the underlying physiology and pathophysiology leading gas and bloating is a visceral perception, remember that many patients with disorders of gut-brain interaction are overly sensitive in the GI tract, we have a host of options. We may use a very low dose neuromodulator, such as a tricyclic antidepressant. Don't think we're treating underlying de depression. What we're using is to block these pain receptors and very low doses can be effective. We may use other antidepressants. Uh, there are two big categories. One are called SNRIs, duloxetine is an example, or we may use SSRIs. And those can be helpful if you have some anxiety as well. Other agents are available, such as gabapentin and pregabalin. Of note, opioids should not be used in any of these disorders because opioids or narcotics will slow the GI tract, make symptoms worse, and it's very easy to become addicted. Finally, that big category of this abnormal viscerosomatic reflux, viscero means your gut. Normally, when gas stretches the small intestine or colon, normally, if we look at the upper right hand corner of the slide, your abdominal mall, wall muscles contract to keep your belly flat and your diaphragm, your breathing muscle ascends to increase the size of your abdominal cavity. But some patients actually have a wiring problem. They have an electrical problem in their GI tract where the, this reflex is reversed. And what happens as shown in the right lower corner of the slide is the diaphragm abnormally descends. That makes your belly cavity smaller and your abdominal wall muscles inappropriately relax. And that's why you get such marked distension. How is that treated? We actually teach patients diaphragmatic breathing. And this slide illustrates how you can do this. Sometimes we use biofeedback. By the way, there are some great YouTube videos on diaphragmatic breathing, and you may want to look at those. What about chronic idiopathic constipation? Chronic means that symptoms started at least six months ago and they've been active in the last three months. Treatment options, I briefly mentioned osmotic agents and I know you've heard other lectures about something like polyethylene glycol sold over the counter as Miralax or Glycolax. We've discussed the secretagogues. They increase fluid secretion into the GI tract and thus increase intestinal transit, lubaprostone, linaclotide, placanotide. And we've discussed these prokinetic agents, these 5-HT4 agonists such as prucalipride and tegasrod, all are very effective and can be very helpful. Lastly, 
What about that uncommon patient with colonic inertia? These are generally women. Um, men can occasionally have it, but much less common. And these are patients who may have a bowel movement every four weeks or six weeks. If you fail medical therapy, and that's a key phrase, if you fail all of these therapies for weeks at a time, and if you do not have a pelvic floor disorder, uh, pelvic floor dyssynergia or a large rectus seal or something else, that should be carefully inv investigated. Then some patients respond to sacral nerve stimulation as shown here. That's done only at specialized centers. The data is okay, in my opinion, not perfect, but okay. And rarely, rarely when symptoms are so severe and patients have failed every single agent we have available and they do not have a pelvic floor problem, then we may recommend removal of the colon. But remember, that's really the last thing that should be done. And once the colon is removed, it's irreversible. And of course, for most patients then, when that's done, they have frequent bowel movements, sometimes six to eight per day. So there is a trade-off. As we wrap up here, as an audience, I think we all recognize that these motility or functional disorders, now called disorders of gut-brain interaction, are common. They affect about 40% of the population overall. Fortunately, in this day and age, multiple treatment options are now available. And when you see your healthcare provider, discuss these individualized options because really it depends on who you are, what your symptoms are, what tests you've had to date, and what treatments you've had. One size does not fit all, but fortunately, again, we have so many different options that there's a treatment out there available for you. Thank you so much for listening today, and thank you for participating in this great IFFGD lecture series.